<laughs> um, so everybody, welcome to our second Master of Professional Writing Faculty and Student Reading Series of the Year. Um, as some of you may know, I'm Nairi. I am uh, the co-coordinator of the reading series, and this is the fantastic Karen Tate. Um, so. Um, so we'd like to thank uh, Barnes & Noble at 3rd Street um, for their uh, support of our program and our events, and Shane for helping organize the night, and Angela, wherever she is running around, uh, for helping us out tonight. Um, and thanks to Corey for filming the evening for our MPW YouTube page, so look out for that. Um, a few reminders, please silence your cell phones. Um, the restrooms are downstairs in the Starbucks, and hang out for cupcakes spooky Halloween cupcakes that Karen found. Um, so before we get started, uh, we wanted to take some time to rem uh, remember one of our classmates, Leonard Pung, who recently passed away. Yeah, um, Leonard was just about to start his second year in the MPW program, and he loved, loved, loved science fiction. He'd already written a sci-fi novel and a screenplay. Uh, Leonard was not only a writer, though. He was also a teacher and a white wa water rafting instructor and a lover of bad Hawaiian shirts and really good cigars. Uh, we would have a moment of silence in his memory, but Leonard was not exactly one for the quiet stuff. So instead, we're going to hear some great new work from his fellow writers in the MPW program. As a night's reading is dedicated to our classmate, Leonard Pong. So. Our in like a poem of letters that you can write? <laughs> a, a, a what? A poem of letters that you can write? Well, if you have one, you can, you can do one later. We'll work that out in you. That will be your job, Greta. Just kidding. <laughs> Our inspiration for this year's overall theme was Mad Libs. And we incorporated that into Joan Gideon's Year of Magical Thinking and came up with the Year of Mad Lib Thinking. Each month, we've chosen titles and quotes from a few famous writers to have some fun with. And tonight, in honor of Halloween week, <laughs> we're featuring Master of the Supernatural, Anne Rice, born October 4th, 1941. We've asked our writers if they could rewrite Rice's avant-garde vampire tone, Interview with the Vampire, how they would fill in Interview with a blank. Anne Rice once said, to write something, you have to make a fool of yourself. So, our writers are also going to tell us if anything they've ever written has followed Rice's instructions. We're also featuring mystery writer Elmore Leonard, who was born October 11th, 1926. His novels include Get Shorty and Out of Sight, and his short stories were the basis for the film 310 to Yuma and the current TV series Justified. We asked our writers tonight if they could rewrite Leonard's first novel, The Bounty Hunters, how they would fill in The Blank Hunters. Leonard also <coughs> counseled writers to never use the word suddenly or all hell broke loose <laughs> and never open a book with weather. But we've given our writers a chance to break all the rules tonight. So our five student readers and special faculty reader, Michael Price, have all finished these Mad Libs in their own way. And we're going to get started with our first reader, who is Mia Mounier. Um, Mia is in her first year nonfiction concentration. She says almost everything she's written makes her feel like a fool in some way, but she takes comfort in knowing it'll never be worse than having her awkward, illustrated love poems posted on the wall of her seventh grade English classroom. <laughs> Something you may not know about Mia is before moving to LA, she lived in a small town in small town Vermont for four years, and she's now full of information that is totally useless in LA like where to find the best apple cider donuts, and when it's appropriate to wear overalls in public, which in Vermont is apparently any time. <laughs> Mia Monier. And anyone who wants to sit down, come on down front. Chairs, plenty of chairs here. Come on down. Thank you, Nairi and Karen. Um, thank you all for having me, and thank you especially to my family and friend Sherry who came out to see me despite the fact that it's kind of a long drive. Um, this piece that I'm going to read today is a couple years old, but um, I wanted to try reading it for my first reading. So thank you for listening. Um, this essay is called Funeral. One of my great aunts died this week. 
She was in her late 80s, and she had been sick for almost as long as I can remember. To me, the news didn't come as a huge surprise. To be honest, up to this point in my life, death has felt so far away from me that I think I barely know how to register it. But in just the past couple of years, it seems that news of a family friend or relative's death has come more and more frequently. Last spring, I lost someone particularly special, a friend named Barbara who died of breast cancer in her early 60s, whose ring I've worn since the summer of my 20th birthday. Within a few months of her death, a friend of my mom's died, this one around the same age as my parents, leaving behind three daughters, the youngest of whom had barely graduated high school. We visited another friend at the hospital last month, he only in his 40s, quickly degenerating under the cancer he learned of less than two years ago. All these encounters with death and dying have hit me similarly. I don't cry. I want to, but in my wanting, I feel guilty and lucky and false. And most of all, I feel young. My Auntie Kay, the one who just passed away, she was part of the extended family who took my mother in when she first moved to the US from Japan more than 30 years ago. Even as my family moved around the country, I remember my LA relatives as one of our few constants. We'd gather in an eclectic group in Auntie Kisai and Uncle Ted's living room at New Year's, passing around wine and admiring the fish. Every year, one of the aunts would make cake and her husband would make scallops. And every year, Auntie Kisai would point at all the different types of osechiriori, the traditional good luck food eaten at Japanese New Year, and tell my brothers and me what to eat for fertility and for happiness. <laughs> Auntie Kay's husband, Uncle Yosh, told concentration camp stories in his gruff voice, brushing them off as entertaining adventures, and Uncle Ted sat smiling, drinking beer out of a glass. My brother snuck outside to stare at the koi in the pond out back, and I hung around the kitchen wondering when I'd be old enough to be offered coffee like my cool older cousin. Uncle Ted died years ago, but Auntie Kisai keeps his photo on a short table in the living room, next to the fireplace, all with, with fresh flowers beside it. On a bookcase across the room, she keeps framed photos of others she's loved and lost. Her two brothers, her parents, cousins whose names I don't know. The morning after learning about Auntie Kay's death, I was, looking, I was locking the front door, leaving the house for another day at my post-college job at the mall, when my cell phone rang in my bag, flashing a private number across the screen. It was Auntie Kisai, worried that we hadn't yet heard the news about her sister. I told her as I walked to my car that my family had all gotten Friday off work and school to make it to the funeral. I heard her voice break, we said goodbye and hung up, and I sat for a while in the driver's seat with my hand on the keys. This month, two of my closest friends moved to Europe, <coughs> one to study forensic anthropology, one to teach English. Old friends I haven't seen since they were 15 or even eight are now teachers, parents, PhD students, work in advertising, have gotten engaged. Our grandparents have died, our parents have gotten divorced, we've come out, gone through depression, been heartbroken and unemployed. But life at 21, 22, feels mostly about possibility. There are almost no ways to go wrong, at least compared to the overwhelming number of potential rights. When I was a kid at Auntie Kisai's house, I used to look at her collection of photographs on the shelf and wonder how it could be that she kept the same photos up all the time. I might have been in middle school then, going through disposable cameras and begging my mom to take me to the drugstore for 24-hour development early the next morning after sixth grade dances so I could refresh the photos on the cork board in my room. To me, there was no time like the present and the very recent past. It finally occurred to me one day at that house in Monterey Park that my auntie's life was more than six times the length of mine, and these people who had been dead for my entire lifetime had been alive for decades first. It's the same as when people wonder why my mom, after living in the States for more than 30 years, still doesn't consider herself American. Moving away from home at 20 doesn't mean you cut your roots and start over, and losing a brother at 40 doesn't mean he's forgotten when you're 90. The funeral happened last weekend at a cemetery in Whittier in their Japanese garden. I was given the job of recording koden, offerings of sympathy in little white envelopes. Though fall had arrived along the coast, it was hot and sunny inland. I wore sunglasses, and unable to see my eyes, people spoke to me in English and Japanese without deliberation. As guests who knew each other better gathered, I thought about this side of the family. They're distant relatives to begin with, almost all of them I know less than I'd like to, and though Auntie Kay has always been in the background of my life, I knew I didn't know her immediate family's pain. 
At the same time, I realized with shameful excitement that I was finally old enough to take in the Japanese American funeral rituals for the first time, my koden collecting job included. And my thoughts drifted more than a little to the dinner date I'd been looking forward to all week. I tried to force my mind to stay still. I watched the funeral from the check-in table as the minister with a thick Filipino accent mispronounced Auntie Kay's name as Kai as he gave a review of her life from her childhood through internment during World War II and her marriage, uh, through internment during World War II and her marriage, through her career as a tailor, all the way through her lifelong love of horse races. At one point during the service, I noticed a banner on one of the flower arrangements next to the casket reading, Beloved Sister. Auntie Kisaya sat in the front row, small beside her niece and nephew-in-law. Next to the casket, poised to be lowered into the ground, was Uncle Yosha's headstone. Two away was Uncle Ted's, the family name in the center, and a blank space on the right, ready to be engraved one day for Auntie Kisai. One of my friends recently interviewed his grandpa on camera. I felt kind of morbid, my friend told me, because he kept asking, why do you want to interview me? What will you do with these stories? As if it hadn't occurred to him that his family might be readying themselves for his death. Three out of four of my grandparents died either before I was born or before I had a, cho before I had a chance to know them. Uncle Ted passed away when I was a kid, and Barbara, the friend whose ring I wear, she had the most adventurous life, and I know barely any of her stories. I hope her family knows them. In some ways, I feel as if my life only really started in the past few years, if not the past few months. It's exhilarating, but everyone who has been young has been here. In high school, I had a teacher who was a little over 10 years older than his senior students. He wore rainbow flip-flops and told stories about his college days and he had his first daughter the year we took his class. He kept a photo on his desk of himself with his wife, young and smiling on a swing, she in his lap. After Barbara died, her husband, Bill, invited me over to look through her clothes to see if I could use any of them. He was in the process of organizing her things. There was yarn all over the dining room table and photos all over the mantel. In one photo, Barbara and Bill are in their 20s. She's gorgeous with intense eyes, mouth open mid-sentence, and he's sitting beside her on the couch looking at her with a smile that looks like adoration and disbelief. For a while after Uncle Ted's death, Auntie Kisai would talk to his photo on the table when we were over. Not in sentences, but little pieces of commentary interspersed through the story she told us. <coughs> nah, dear, she'd say toward the photo, as if for confirmation. Isn't that right, dear? And I wonder what it must have been like for them in the beginning, telling stories together stealing kisses, starting their lives. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mia. Our next writer is Nathan Kayanan, who's in his second and last year at MPW with a fiction concentration. Nathan's Rice-inspired book would be Interview with the Moose Hunters, AKA, Sundays with the Palins. <coughs> <laughs> and he breaks Leonard's rules with, on a blinding autumn California afternoon, the Bruins were suddenly angered when they ran out of arugula. But when they also ran out of cupcakes, all hell broke loose. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Nathan says, we may not know he is engaged to the best woman in the world. And when all the husbands and boyfriends say, their girlfriends or wives are the best, they're lying, because he is the one who has her. Nathan Kayana. Uh, hello. Uh, the thing I'm reading is actually the first thing I ever wrote. It's called Jade. I actually <coughs> wrote this before I even got into the MPW program, so uh, enjoy. <coughs> Between the boys and their father were plates of medium rare Angus beef and baskets of Texas toast. Nicholas was only 16 then, and in their father's eyes, uh, already a man who had inherited everything good about him, his broad shoulders, his defined brows, and his devilish smile that he claimed was proof that they had in their veins the blood of a Filipino Spaniard. Their father told jokes about lawyers and priests and heaven and hell, platitudes that made Nicholas and his brother Ezra cringe as their father's eyes wandered around the uncovered, to the uncovered windows and glass doors. Bloated off of bread and beef, they walked out into the parking lot, 
where their father's brand new Mercedes Benz whistled at them when he held up his key for the world to take notice. When the trunk popped open, he reached for two trash bags and threw them to the ground, telling the boys that they were filled with clothes that no longer fit him. Their father was a real estate agent, back when times were good, when a Mercedes was a necessary business expense for agents of his caliber, facts that made his taste lavish. When the boys reached into the trash bags, they pulled out shirts and slacks with names that they'd never heard of, that they concluded were European, and that they could not afford themselves. Their father reached further into the trunk, pulling out a pair of brilliant black shoes that were polished just for this moment. He dropped them to the ground, their clops echoing throughout the parking lot. Try the mana. His accent buried into his baritone voice. They tried on the clothes, the shoes, all in the parking lot as their father held up his trunk with his palm, his head low, his eyes shifting left to right as if he were dealing drugs. They fit, he announced. Nicholas shifted his feet that pulsed as the shoes squeezed the blood out of them. Oh, before I forget, their father reached back into the trunk and pulled out a small velvet sack. He held it upside down and let a ring fall out. For you, for when you graduate. He held it out to Nicholas. It was a gaudy thing, one, that, one with a scale snake pattern, with dirt within his crevices wrapped around the thick gold band which held a marble-sized jade ball. Will you wear it, he asked. Nicholas would not. He could not imagine himself with all its bluster walking up to his friends with this artifact around his finger. But when he looked at his father smiling, pleading, he could not say no. On nice occasions, he said. Okay, well, I'll call you soon, huh? He embraced his boys, smacked them on the back, and drove off to his new family. When Nicholas and his brother went back home, their mother asked, so what did he give you now? They showed her the trash bags of clothes, the box of food from the restaurant, and the ring. Your father, <laughs> always living like there's no tomorrow. Spend, 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 that's all he does. She said this as if to make sure her boys remembered who had raised them, but she did this also to hide her envy. Nicholas, knowing better than to defend the man <coughs> who left her, went upstairs to his room, where he sat at his desk looking at the ring. He asked himself, who would wear such a thing? Perhaps kings or mobsters, but not a 16-year-old Filipino boy from the suburbs of Riverside County. <laughs> he wondered how much it was worth and concluded that since it was solid gold and real jade, two things he'd never seen, let alone had, that it was worth hundreds of dollars, a notion that actually flattered him. My father, he thought, gave me this expensive ring. It looked old and passed along throughout many generations, and he decided that when he was older, he would pass it along to his eldest son. But right then, a sudden uneasiness came over him. It was one of those moments when one becomes very aware of his surroundings. He felt as though he was supposed to have come to some epiphany, as though he'd reached a transcendent state of being where everything around him felt hollow and phony. There was a brief reticence that quickly changed to nervous panic. His throat and jaw began to tense and his heart was racing. He was strangely forgetting who he was and why he was in that house. He took steady, deep breaths and began to whisper his own name again and again until it sounded like he was clicking his tongue. Nick, 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 nick. His head hurt and he closed his eyes. He remembered the day his father took the family to the beach and the waves that snuck up to the shore, a memory that brought him to another of them at the park down the street of the first house Nicholas lived in. He'd hoped these memories would bring him calm, but no matter how much he tried not to, he began to relive the night before his father left, when he peeked down the hallway into his parents' room, where they were yelling at each other in a language he did not understand because he was born in America. He remembered staring at the ceiling that night, trying to sleep, making stucco constellations of Snoopy and Ninja Turtles, the walls rumbling with the murmurs of his mother's accusations. And when this sequence of thoughts came to closing, uh, came close to ending, he finished with himself the next morning, 
looking at his mother as she lay in bed staring at the ceiling, perhaps making constellations of her own. His father was long gone. He was only six then. Memories are a funny thing, Nicholas often thought. You can't stop them, you can't change them. They're inevitabilities, they're predetermined truths. And so he placed the ring on the cherry wood desk and laid in his bed. The room dim, he stared at the ceiling, waiting for his thoughts to become dreams. He listened to the air rush in and out of his nostrils, and his muscles became jelly against the soft mattress. He envisioned himself going to school the next day, and what the girl who sat in front of him in his honors English class would do when he'd enter the room. She would turn around, smile at him, maybe ask him out. He let this vision take control of itself as he fell into this dream, and he hoped that in the morning he would love his father again. Um, our next reader is Laurel Wetzark. Laurel is in her first semester in the MPW. Uh, concentration is writing for stage and screen. Um, Laurel's book titles would be Interview with One of the Murdoch Clones and The Bushwalking, Bushwhacking Badass Boob Hunters. Uh, Laurel's first creative effort, written in eighth grade, came back covered in red ink with scathing comments about Laurel's apparently non-existent writing ability and a C-. minus, She was so ashamed of receiving such a bad grade in her A's only family that she didn't write anything fictional again for 20 years. Now she's getting her master's at USC, so in your face, eighth grade teacher, <laughs> Laurel Wetzer. Um, because I'm stage and screen, I'm doing a uh, play and I have two actors here to um, read the parts, and I'm reading stage directions. Uh, this is Robert Seeley, and this is Karina Line. Karina Line is... <laughs> okay, uh, this is entitled, Out of Here. Setting, on a slightly wooded hill outside of the city of Pleasant Hope, Missouri, midsummer near sunset, the chiggers, ticks, mosquitoes, and cicadas are thick and noisy. Of the several fallen, fallen and rotting logs, one down center seats two people. At rise, Bill galoops slowly up to a tree, presses several broken tree limbs in succession. There is a roar of sound as a UFO's beams blast him with eerie green lights. He shades his eyes and waves. The roar and lights fade. Bull pull, Bill pulls out a paper bag, it contains an apple, and sets it on the ground. Next, he pulls out a tobacco tin, then a wad of tobacco, and chews. After a moment, Gratchner the alien, Gra for short, stalks up. The excessive noise and lights, really, Gra? Hit wrong button on descent. How is contest preparation proceeding? Excellent, since the addition of the sixth intelligence implant. Hmm, side effects? Other than being up to seven of these a day? <laughs> Addiction excuses many behaviors in humans. Uh, people are beginning to notice that I don't spit. <laughs> 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 Mm, good. Yes, yes. It feeds your enhanced neural nicotine receptors. What is that excessive noise? Uh, chiggers and ticks are hungrier at sunset. They might succeed in burrowing through your skin suit. Gra turns on a flashlight-like device and beams the ground. The insect sounds stuck. Why not use D? D kills. We do not. Uh, insects, that is. They're sleeping and will awake soon. Look, Gra, I am growing impatient. I must win this adult spelling contest for the prize monies in order to move myself and my family to St. Louis, in spite of our, uh, our, y y you know... Sexual pleasures? Yeah. Yes. Uh, repeating apologies for the uh, pregnancy. Yeah, I did inform you that men on this planet don't become pregnant. <laughs> Sexual pleasures do become addicting, but no human suspected. Oh, they presumed beer belly. <coughs> then gastric bypass surgery. <laughs> Good. In regards to your request for moving, not yet. Uh, perhaps you will win next year with a more advanced implant. I am completing it. Um, don't look at me in this way. These emotions and desires you humans have, they begin to arouse me. I'm sick of observing this pitiful town's population of 604 humans for you, and especially the, thir the, and especially the 32 men in my combo church confessional slash fishing class whom I've observed way too much. 
And how many of the observations of lake fishing by dynamite do you require? <laughs> you must continue previous entertainments or suspicion arises. Uh, the time will come when those above agree. You must remain here. I anticipated your answer. And I'm moving my family tomorrow. So that you don't stop me, I also invented this weapon that will melt your suit. He pulls out the apple and aims the stem at Grah. Nonsense. My sensors would show. Crapulous! Uh, I forgot to erase the fifth intelligence module sub uh -huh. uh, That was a mistake. Please, please, I, I am grown fond of you. I desire other sexual experiments to please us. Do not make me. No, no! No, no more sex for you. It, 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 it's too, um, it's tempting. And, 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 no, stop that. Put that back. <laughs> Pregnancy sucks. <laughs> Explain how we soon may move out of here, out of this damn hellhole. It is not my decision. I report as you report to others. What others? Tell me what others, or I shoot this core out at you. Shakes the apple bra. No, no shaking the weapon. My advisors. I have advisors. What? I am a student of similar level to graduate in the college of your species. I conduct a study. You are one of the participants, and it is essential you remain until I'm dead. A study? I'm part of a thesis? <laughs> and you said one. H how many more of us? Hmm. An ex-pancake cook, now turned preacher, who is currently amending the Urantia books, a uh, public works solid waste manager in Walla Walla, Washington, and Italian from Otranto. Wait, wait, I know. The man who invented the new pizza oven that cooks a pizza at 900 degrees safely in your own home in 37 seconds, that guy? He's made millions. When will you let me contribute to humanity? Your original goal was to win the spelling event, not move to St. Louis. I help you with the original goal. Besides, I've grown fond of pizza, and I'm not patient. Someone needed to invent that pizza oven. Uh, and you must not leave, or I will fail. There, there will be death. Death? Are these implants going to explode? Y you said you didn't kill people. I said we don't kill insects. Mm. I will not let you kill me, you crazy alien. I will pull the stem and... No, no, no. You misunderstand. I will fail my thesis project and die at the hands of my dishonored father. Please, you must help me. I must receive, what do you call it, um, a doctorate. And you, being part of this study, it is an honor. You are well known upon our planet, a hero. For being a yahoo in the city of Pleasant Hope? What a joke. I have my own honor, you know. There's so much more I want to do. I want to go back to school and become a doctor who specializes in head trauma. Grah, disarmed Phil with lightning speed, aims the apple and a thumb-operated handheld device at Phil. <coughs> I must finish my thesis. I regret, but I must deactivate your implants. I will start with the sixth module and reverse your intelligence. There may be some pain. Apologies. Ah. Grah thumbs the device. Beep, boop, beep, boop. Oh. oh, wait, 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 now, Grah, no. Wait, please, listen. Uh, the reason I want to be a doctor is because of my youngest brother. I mean, y you come back from the war or whatever it is in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever he was posted, and, and you're supposed to be a hero. It's not okay that 18 vets commit suicide every day and where some of them wait six months, six months before getting an appointment for treatment or help. Now my cousin's just gotten back. I can use that treatment you inadvertently left in, my, in Module 5 how to repair blast-related TBI, diffuse axonal or subdural hemorrhage, and heal the effects of electromagnetic pulses and any damage to the optic nerve. Fifth module, intelligence deactivation, will begin. Apologies for pain in lower region. Jesus Christ <laughs> almighty, I thought you didn't hurt people. Uh, fourth intelligence, module deactivation commencing. There will be cerebral pain and some um, term does not translate. Ow! Oh, oh, oh! Don't you care about your brother? What if you, what if you wanted to help him but couldn't? I'm more like you now. We're we're like we've been like brothers, sisters, uh, uh sort of, except for the sex, which was <laughs> wow. <laughs> but um, look, look, I, I I do love my family, but I can't talk to them. The only one I can talk to now is, is, is you. Third implant deactivation. Side effects, nausea and numbness. Oh, oh gross. <laughs> Kinda, oh, oh. What was I saying? 
brothers, my brother. You have a brother? You were glad you felt a, 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 a what do you call it, a sudden um, emotion? Not one made up by your implants. And we can laugh more. You keep my things, the implants in, and things. Second implant deactivation. Memory erasure mode begins. Ugh. <laughs> well, that's fucking hot in here. <laughs> My head, shit, it goddamn hurts. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> are, are, are we like trapped? Is this, um, is this that thing that's like dirt but a hill and it's got like water around it? Um, salty? What? Wow. You look like you come from some city or something. What a weird fucking suit, man. <laughs> For sure you're not from around here. Graal speaks into a recording device. Initiate reboot for thesis project restart, restart number seven. <laughs> Effects of dynamite fishing on subcranial capacity in the human species. Final implant deactivation begin. Oh. Did I just hurl? <laughs> Did we like um, beer or something or? <coughs> You got really nice tits. <laughs> I mean, for a girl. <laughs> girl thing. I, I mean, you look kind of, um, for, you know, whatever you are, you, you, you're like hot, man. This is fucking weird. <laughs> okay, so, so maybe we could be bros or um, friends or something. I, I had a bro. I mean, man, I loved him. He was the best. Taught me all sorts of shit. I got an AK-47 and some other shit he snuck home. <laughs> and he shot himself in the head. Fucking waste. I don't got a bro no more. So... You want to hang out or something? We could go dynamite fishing with my church group. <laughs> you ever been dynamite fishing? The lights fade to black. <laughs> Um, our next reader is Kelsey Ochaba. Kelsey is in her first year in the MPW program with a concentration in fiction. And Kelsey handles Leonard with the rain poured down outside hitting sharply against the windows. Suddenly, Elmore Leonard walked in and slapped me hard across the face for opening a story with weather. It was then, while holding my smarting cheek, eyes slanted and glaring at Leonard, that all hell broke loose. Something we may not know about Kelsey is that she has an anchor tattoo on the back of her neck that she got for her grandmother, who was a fisherwoman. It was inspired by the last line of Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. So we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Kelsey, what's your mind? Thanks. Thanks, Nairi and Karen. Um, this is a piece that I did that I just wanted to kind of do for Halloween. So, happy Halloween, everybody. Okay, um, fleshy fables. The, mov the movies were wrong, television shows, even more so. In the books, forget about it. Everyone was wrong, wrong, wrong. The date was August 24th, 2018, a hot, humid summer day. Had the young man only been sitting on a rooftop baking in the Southern California sun, sans the, the swarm of undead standing outside of his house, he would have sworn that he was in hell. 
But alas, he was sitting on top of a roof, the shingles too slippery for his liking, and there was a swarm of undead rotting away as they circled his house looking for a way in. Hell was a severe reality. He thought that maybe he could be dreaming. His lack of hydration had him seeing the world in hyper surreal colors. A Van Gogh painting come to life. The palm trees swayed under the warm breeze, their fronds bright yellows and oranges. He imagined that he could see the wind, leaving swirls and wisps imprinted on the air. The man shook his head, trying to clear the image. Upon opening his eyes, he saw that it stayed the same. By his calculation, he had been marooned in this house for a very long 18 days. That was in addition to the 73 days that had already passed in which the world came tumbling down. He didn't know the logistics of it. He wasn't even sure if they mattered anymore. This was, of course, right. Even now, across the country, there were dwindling numbers of humanity left over. The several others who were trapped in their prospective houses considered the possibilities of a cure, to which, it should be mentioned, the answer didn't actually matter when the human race is shrunk down to just near 300 people in America. And so the logistics, while interesting the puzzle over, just didn't do the young man any good. His name was Jacob, or rather it had been, when mundane things such as name and age mattered. He was a lean, verging on scrawny, 19-year-old. His outlook on life matched that of a grumpy old man that was tired of living. His brown hair had begun to fall out in patches, probably, he thought, because of malnutrition. And his skin peeled in places, flaking off in the sun. Though he could not have known this, it was his skin in the end that attracted this particular group to his door. His scent drifting on the air had let them know that there was fresh blood to feed from nearby. But here he was, alive, and even considering the addition of the horde of zombies waiting outside of his door, he was, for the most part, well. Jacob stood facing over the front yard. Several of the zombies had pulled up beach chairs and were taking in the sun. The other half dozen paced, looking desirably up the roof. There was one in particular that stood, finger to his chin, a look of contemplation in his dead eyes. The look was not unfamiliar to Jacob, but it nonetheless made him feel nervous. The zombie looked better fed than the others that he had seen in the past and feared that his intelligence was beyond that of the average undead. Exhaling loudly, he watched methodically as the undead man jerkily moved back and forth. He was thankful these last three days of how little muscle control the deceased actually had over their bodies grateful that their strength deteriorated with whatever sickness had taken them over. These zombies were very unlike those that the world knew through pop culture. Colloquially, they had begun to be known as rotters, though their desiccated bodies were the only true things that actually rotted. And even then, though containing a lack of muscle mass, they seemed to have exceptional aim when they ch so chose to focus on a specific target. Their minds had somehow gone unscathed. Rotters awakened from their first deaths to be manipulative and cunning. They were not mindless, as fiction had led everyone to believe. Jacob's face reddened under the sun. Swiping at a bead of sweat, he again considered the rotter that watched him <coughs> intently from below. The face listed to the left, the skin falling from the cheek. There was a mangled piece of flesh that hung from his open mouth. His eyes were glazed over, and he continued to cast a milky gaze up at Jacob. He waved. Jacob nodded back. Acknowledging the dead was a better option than ignoring them. <laughs> Hello there, Jacob called down, his voice hoarse. Days had passed since he had last spoke to anyone. What can I do for you? The group of rotters gathered around at the sound. Though the women stayed put, soaking in the sun, their skin festering and stinking up the otherwise oceanic air. <laughs> ah, called the contemplative zombie. I see now, you should really come down. Your distance is frustrating and really makes me frown. The rotter licked his lips and moved forward slightly. One of his eyes slid down in its socket. <laughs> it had been a long time since Jacob had conversed with anyone, especially a zombie, so long that he had forgotten the way that their brains seemed to act in the infantile wavelength of rhyme. Pushing his hair back from his eyes, Jacob replied, I can't come down and you can't come up. What else can I do for you? He thought about the boarded up windows and the metal locks across all of the doors. This house had been prepared and sadly he wondered what must have happened to the previous family. The group of rotters moved about angrily, but, but, the leader stammered over his words, you've got brains in your head and some toes in your shoes. He looked around excitedly, but I'd start with your eyes if I could so choose. The others nodded in agreement. Some tried to clap their hands together. One missed and his hand hit a tree, snapping the bone backward. <laughs> well, yes, that's true, Jacob said, humoring them. I do have all of those things, and really, I would like to keep them if you don't mind. Jacob turned to go back through the skylight into the top, the top floor bedroom. You're on your own, Jacob heard the voice call, the sound taunting. He turned back around, and you're scared that we know. But wait all you'd like, you have nowhere to go. Even from a distance, Jacob saw the mischievous glint in the one wide eye that remained rolling around in that head. The other eye continued to inch further and further down the rotter's face. You sit atop your house above us all, he continued as Jacob moved forward. Jacob had never heard a zombie speak quite so much. You know that we are waiting to cushion your fall. But cushion we won't, instead we would move, giving your brains plenty of splatter room. The horde murmured excitedly around their leader. 
Jacob thought at this point that he should turn and go back inside. Nothing good could have come, good could have come out of this conversation. Goosebumps rose along the back of his neck. Even in the 97 degree heat, Jacob wrapped his arms around his body and attempted, albeit poorly, to control his breathing. The zombie continued, and if you should fail, then no without fail. If you should fall, then no without fail. I will collect all of your insides in my shiny gray pail. He laughed giddily. I will take them back home and set the table, and you'll be wishing, young man, that zombies were just a fable. That's enough, Jacob yelled down, his insides squirming in discomfort. I'm going inside. You should all leave. Wait. But your eyes, like I said, are so good to me, dead. But I think that I would savor the taste instead. So to the bottom of my gin and soda they will go before I pluck them out with my fingers like so. He performed a plucking motion, and his pack followed his lead. Their chuckling continued. And from there I will start with your stomach and heart. The eating of flesh you see requires an art. So come on down, there's no time to waste. I'd like to continue on in my haste. You see, my dear friend, there are more humans to taste. The zombie held his stomach, literally, as the movement of it bending over caused his insides <laughs> to pitch forward out of an open gash, and let out loud guffaws of laughter. Jacob was angered at this point. He hated the rotters for taunting him in such a way. Hated himself even more for letting them get to him. I'm not kidding, he yelled down to the group. Get out of here. He considered tossing down a burning match. Jacob saw in his mind the image of the undead lighted in flames, their rhymes fading into the night along with their screams as the final death took them away. But come, won't you please, it would so appease to see the young face untouched by disease. The lead rotter inched forward, trying and failing to stand on his toes. One actually snapped off under his weight, and Jacob watched as it rolled away under a nearby, por nearby porch step. Would you leave then if I give you one last closer look? At this, the group of zombies nodded enthusiastically. Their decrepit bodies piecing off in some areas. Their bodies jerked in unison as they moved to gather a better glimpse of Jacob as he bent forward at the rain gutter along the house. Jacob's thoughts were centered on the glorious image of the rotters suffering under bounties of flame. They were so centered, in fact, that as he looked downward and onto the sicky, sickly, stringy, semi-lifeless bodies before him, he forgot to look for the lady zombies that had been intent on their sunbathing only minutes prior. Jacob's momentary lack of attention to detail, the same attention that had saved him for the last 91 days of his life, made him unaware of the snickers of women around the corner of the house. He was so concentrated on his wistful thoughts that he barely had time to recognize the sound of a trigger being pulled before the bullet th flew through the right side of his brain and out his left, claiming his life. Jacob's body tumbled head over feet before settling on the ground, where, in fact, the zombies did move, giving his brain plenty of splatter room. The leader of the rotters moved, jerk moved jerkily forward and plucked out Jacob's eyes, using his bone-thin fingers as toothpicks to examine the cool blue that had not yet vanished from them. As the group surrounded the body, the leader hobbled away, whistling happily under his breath, I warned you, kid. Really, I did, but you insisted on fighting, and now from your body, you are rid. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, our final student reader of the evening is Alex Harvey Gurr, uh, who is in her second year fiction concentration. Alex's new Anne Rice title would be Interview with a Twithead Who Can... Who can explain to me what exactly is so appealing about a glittering vampire? Alex says, what's the point in writing something that doesn't make you at least a little embarrassed? If you don't, then you haven't put any of yourself into your work, and therefore it probably isn't worth reading. We, uh, we may not know about Alex that she eats Carl's Jr. and Taco Bell in parked cars in secret. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> Alex Harvey Gurr. everyone who came out tonight. We know there's a lot you can be doing on Friday nights and we really appreciate the support. So tonight I'm going to be reading an abbreviated version of the first chapter of my thesis, which is about a sociopath. So a little halloween -y. <laughs> They ate Chinese takeout by candlelight while Keith drank warm Chardonnay the night he decided to kill her. He sat across from Rebecca, watching her sip at her Pellegrino from a wine glass. The flame's light rippled out across her pale Nordic face, making it look almost like she was underwater. He had, she had made a table using the good china and glasses, the ones they usually save for Keith's prospective clients, a pitiful apology that he had no intention of accepting. Keith speared a piece of orange chicken with the tip of his cheap chopstick and brought it to his lips. He scowled when a sticky chunk fell and rolled lazily down his chest, staining his Armani dress shirt. He dropped the chopsticks onto the plate and slid the wine glass closer to him. 
The glass scraped hollowly against the wood, and he watched as the sound made Rebecca shiver. It's Tuesday. He watched Rebecca stop pushing her cashew chicken around on her noritake plate and squint her ice blue eyes at him. It was the first time their eyes had met all dinner. Hmm? She started bouncing her leg beneath the dining table. Her knee hit hard against the thick mahogany leg posts with each bounce, making the gra greasy chow mein noodles jiggle like earthworms after a fresh rain. Rebecca was more nervous than usual around Keith that night. He liked that. She should be nervous. We have stroganoff on Tuesdays. The bounces started to get harder. The committee meeting ran late, Rebecca said. It's kind of nice having a little bit of a change, though, yes? A little break in the routine, yes? Her tongue stumbled in its rush to get the words out. Keith grunted. Never been a big fan of change. Rebecca said nothing and lifted her glass to her lips, leaving it there. Her gulps echoed in the silent dining room, bouncing off of the heavy shadows lining the walls and rushing back to Keith's ears like a bat sonar in the night, the loud, self-conscious gulps of the anxious. Keith watched her swallow mouthful after mouthful of sparkling water in the dim light, watched how the thick car lives surrounding her thyroid bobbed up and down, up and down. He had once taken pleasure in doing this, watching her neck while she drank. She'd had such a gorgeous neck when she was young. Rebecca had been a beautiful woman then, the type of woman that men of power and influence always want, the type of woman Keith knew he needed to have on his arm if he wanted to make it in Kalina's. Slender and European with pointed features and bright, excitable eyes, she was a desirable woman, a much af sought after commodity that Keith couldn't allow any other man to have. Most men had wanted her for her wasp waist, round breasts, and soft, submissive voice. Keith had wanted her for her neck. Delicate and white like a crane's, marred only by a splattering of faded freckles here and there. It had been the most beautiful neck he had ever seen. Keith had married her for her neck. He had enjoyed touching it back then, brushing his fingertips down its soft front, running them along her clavicle bones, resting them in the hollow jugular notch at the base of her throat. He had spent hours dreaming of her neck, pressing down on it with his palms feeling it quiver and spasm beneath the pressure, watching its pale flesh flush pink, then red, then angry purple. These had always been Keith's favorite dreams. Now, eight years later, he could hardly stand to look at Rebecca's neck, let alone touch it. Hints of folds had begun to form beneath her chin, the beginnings of sunspots and wrinkles, the early, the first warning signs of decrepitude. She had become a woman in her 30s with the neck of a middle-aged man. It was disgusting, and more importantly, it was disappointing. Keith should have known it wouldn't age well. Necks rarely did. Women rarely did. Keith took another sip of wine, wondering how her lover could find her attractive. Steve's case wrapped up today, Keith said, his voice steady and monotonous while he ran the pads of his fingers, his thumb and index finger slowly up the slender stem, making the glass squeal slightly as it rubbed against it. The Lynette Luttrell one. You know it, right? Everyone here knows it, love, she said. Did she get off? Not guilty on all counts. I knew she didn't do it. She's one of us. Keith brought another greasy bite of chicken to his lips and chewed slowly. Yes, one of us. He watched Rebecca's face relax a bit in the candlelight. She thought that his agreeing with her meant he'd forgiven her, that she was off the hook, that he hadn't figured her out. He could see it in the cocky smirk that filled her candlelit eyes, that self-righteous look that all guilty people have when they think they've gotten away with their indiscretions. Stupid cunt, Keith thought to himself. Lynette Luttrell is guilty, he said, no question about it. She killed her husband. But you said she got off. Doesn't mean she isn't guilty, she did it. She knew her husband was fucking a girl their daughter's age and just couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't stand the shame of it all. Keith looked pointedly at Rebecca, his eyes slicing through the dimming light and boring into hers. So she slid his jugular with an heirloom letter opener like it was the cable bill. Ugh, Rebecca cried out, do you have to be so flippant? Did it while he was sleeping, too. The only way she could have done it, really. He picked up a he picked a cheese sorry. He picked a piece of chicken skin out from beneath his teeth with his thumbnail. I wonder if he felt anything. Good God, I hope not, Rebecca said, a small piece of noodle falling from her lips as he spoke. He eyed the half chewed sliver lying on the plate of soggy chicken stewing in a soup of lukewarm oil and MSG. The rancid stench of grease and cheap sauce was almost strong enough to overpower the smell of another man's cologne on her skin, in her hair, on her neck. She wasn't dumb, Lynette Luttrell, he said. This wasn't some thoughtless crime of passion. She had a plan. So few of them have plans. You sound like you're impressed with her. He watched Rebecca absentmindedly flick at her wedding ring with the side of her pinky finger. 
He wondered if she took the ring off for Miles or if she left it on when he let her fuck him from behind. Like the pathetic little bitch she was. Keith leaned back in his chair, feeling the wood press into his back and wishing it were his palm pressing into her throat until the whites of her eyes blossomed red with blood. He bet she left it on. Lynette Luttrell put on her jogging clothes and brought out the trash, making sure she took her time and made enough noise so that the neighbors could hear her. After that, all she had to do was walk back into the house and scream real loud through the open bedroom door, for the neighbors, you know, before she called the cops sobbing about how an intruder had broken into the house and killed her husband. Finally got to put that college theater training of hers to good use, cried real tears and everything. Could have fooled the best of them. I'm sure, Rebecca mumbled idly, not bothering to glance up from her plate. It's a sloppy plan, though. No witnesses could testify that they saw an intruder lurking around the house that night, and she'd left her fingerprints on the envelope opener. One even had traces of his blood in it. It should have been a slam-dunk case for the prosecution. The candle was nearing the end of its wick, its flame flickering frantically as it struggled to live and burn on, dim as it was. Keith could barely see Rebecca as the shadows closed in around, more around her, but even in the dark he could see her glossy eyes, her lips parted just enough so that he could catch a glimpse of her white front teeth. He could hear her breathing through her mouth across the table, shallow and wet in your silent pants. She sounded like a bitch in heat. Keith knew she was thinking about Miles again, their afternoon together, how their tryst had gone on so long that she had had to order takeout for dinner had been so pleasurable that she'd forgotten she needed to chill the wine before he got home. He pressed his fingers hard into the stem of the wine glass and twirled it, watching the wine swirl helplessly inside. There was too much evidence against her, so Steve put her character on trial instead, reminded the jury, Kalina's people, her people, our people, of how he, she heads up the Girl Scout troops and volunteers at bingo nights at the senior home and all that Good Samaritan bullshit. Then he found some moron who was willing to testify that he'd seen a run-down pickup truck parked down the street. You know, one of the rusty old beat-up 90s Mazdas the illegals drive. And that was that. No one could verify that there was any pickup, but by then it didn't matter. The jury has it in their stupid little heads that Lynette Luttrell is <coughs> the tragic victim of a crime perpetrated by a vicious white-hating Mexican that's now loose in the wind. It was genius. And that worked. Keith poured the rest of the wine into his mouth, watching his wife carefully over the lip of the glass. Her eyes were glazed over, looking at him without even a facade of interest on her face anymore. She thought that he was too wrapped up in talking about the case to notice her thinking about another man right in front of him, and now she was bored. She yawned widely, not covering her mouth with her hand, comfortable enough with her surroundings to not bother with manners. He swallowed heavily, forcing back an excited grin. The dumb bitch, she really didn't even think he knew. She really thought that she was getting away with it. Stupid cunt wasn't going to run like a charm. They delivered for four or five hours tops, free to go. Keith put his empty wine glass on the table. It really was something. Yeah, something evil. Rebecca yawned again. Do you want me to put open another bottle for you, love? The candle's flame flickered and dimmed, fading into nothingness as it sank into the liquid wax and drowned. The patient shadows rushed in from the corners of the room, eager to fill the void. It was so easy, Keith thought to himself as the shadows slithered around Rebecca's wrinkling, freckled neck the same way his fingers sometimes did in his dreams. So very easy. And Lynette had been sloppy. Keith smiled to himself, feeling alive. He wouldn't be sloppy. No, Rebecca, I would not. Thank you, Alex. Very creepy. <laughs> Our final reader of the night is our MPW faculty member, Michael Price. Michael grew up in suburban New Jersey, got a BA in theater from Montclair State University, and an MFA in directing for the theater from Tulane University. He got into TV writing by way of writing and performing sketch comedy with New York's Gotham City Improv Theater. He's worked in both live action and animation and has spent the past 11 years as a writer and co-executive producer on The Simpsons. Anybody heard of that? <laughs> He's also written and produced a pair of acclaimed Lego Star Wars specials for Lucasfilm and the Cartoon Network. Based on his early years as a writer for sitcoms teetering on the brink of cancellation, Michael would change Elmore Leonard's title to The Back Nine Hunters. <laughs> <laughs> years ago, 
at the beginning of his career, he took a two-week job writing material for a comedy reality pilot called If Animals Could Talk. <laughs> he had to watch dozens of hours of stock animal footage and think of jokes for them to say. <laughs> Though he can't remember any of the jokes, he knows in his heart that they were all varying degrees of terrible. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Price. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Nairi and Karen, for having me. And uh, I'm so happy to see some of my uh, students here tonight. Uh, so this is for my first ever uh, reading of this kind. Uh, my piece is called Hooray for West Hollywood. Um, <laughs> by the time I decided to move to LA from New Jersey at the age of 30, I was already 20 years into a love affair with the idea of Hollywood. Once I got here, and before I ever got meaningful employment in the TV industry, I got to know Hollywood the place, and despite seeing its ugly aside, nothing could make me leave. Not failure, not rejection, not poverty, nothing. You couldn't have made me move back if you pointed a gun at my head. And I know this is true, because someone did point a gun at my head. <laughs> it was a nine millimeter Glock. <laughs> And it was pointed at my head by a nine-year-old boy. <laughs> by that point, I had been in Hollywood for almost two years with nothing to show for it. You'd think with having a gun pointed at my head, I'd get the message. But if I had, I wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, to say that I was a TV kid would be an understatement. Lots of kids like TV. I inhaled it, especially comedy. My love of comedy came naturally to me because, like many Irish Catholics, our family's preferred way of showing our love for each other was through vicious mockery. <laughs> Hence my younger brother Patrick's nickname for me, Television Eyes, uh, which he would trot out quite often in a scene that would play something like this. Him, hey Mike, let's go play catch. Me, no, but the F troop with Harvey Corman as the visiting Prussian general is on. <laughs> Him, Television Eyes. <laughs> Television Eyes about seven more times. <laughs> well, my television eyes persisted through high school and I started enjoying writing jokes and being funny. Uh, I won't tell you all of the first joke I ever wrote as a kid when I was age 12, but the punchline will suffice to tell you what the setup was. The punchline was, with friends like these, who needs enemas? <laughs> I started imitating my teachers to get laughs, especially my chemistry teacher in high school, the mole-faced Mr. Morgan, who droned incessantly about the boring Boyle's Law of Chemistry. Now, Boyle's Law says that it's time for me to go to the bathroom because I just had an enema. Okay, my material was a little limited at first. <laughs> but I did get laughs. Uh, then I came across the first ever Saturday Night Live companion book put out midway through the second season of SNL, which reprinted several of my favorite sketches with the names of the writers on them on the top, and my mind was blown. People were paid to write this stuff. <laughs> I knew then what I wanted to do, and I was going to make that happen now. Before you could say 15 years later, <laughs> I was in Los Angeles trying to make it big. After college and grad school as a theater major, four years working with college friends on our own theater company in Newark, New Jersey, and training in sketch writing and performing with Gotham City Improv in New York. I was now part of a comedy duo who had worked for three years bringing our act from a tiny cabaret in Greenwich Village to the big time of LA. We moved here to LA with a finely honed act, good reviews in New York, an entree to a high powered agent at one of the big four agencies, and certain in the knowledge that we were going to be major stars within a month or two. That didn't happen, and it didn't happen pretty fast. Uh, after a series of showcase performances at the Comedy Store on Sunset Boulevard, we were inundated with meetings at all the major networks, where we were greeted with a variation of the following phrase, we love your act, what else have you got? <laughs> As it happened, we had nothing. Uh, our partnership quickly dissolved, and I was on my own in LA with about $200 to my name. And I did what I always have done, I got another in the string of survival jobs the last of which would put me looking down the barrel of that little kid's gun. Let me take a moment just to say that in many ways I was very smart. I was book smart. 
but in the ways that counted, I was a functioning moron. <laughs> My only employable skill was in knowing how to be funny and write that funny thing down on a piece of paper. <laughs> Beyond that, my only other skill, I'll go so far as to call it a genius, was at seeking out and holding the worst, most demeaning and dispiriting of day jobs. <laughs> the jobs I took before I moved to LA were very different, but had one thing in common. They sucked, and I sucked at them. <laughs> I was a proofreader. I taught high school English. I tested medical devices. I tried to sell Disney VHS tapes over the phone. <laughs> the only one of these jobs that was even vaguely connected to show business was with a walk-around agency that, uh, in New York that occasionally hired me to get dressed up in costume as decoration for parties and such, with other people, of course. It paid about $100 for a five-hour gig, or in other words, a fortune. Uh, my most lucrative walk-around gig was a best-of-Broadway-themed New Year's Eve party for high rollers at the Trump Castle Casino in Atlantic City, where I dressed as Yul Brynner's character in The King and I, bald cap and all, and among other indignities, had a drunk rich guy rip a tuft of my chest hair off when I tried to stop him from hitting on Evita. <laughs> that was also my last gig with this agency. So years later in LA, as my dreams of instant Hollywood started and went up in smoke, I did what I had always done. I got more sucky jobs. The best was a survey job where I made phone calls on behalf of Hollywood Studios asking folks in cities all around the country what they thought about upcoming movie releases. I was finally working in Hollywood. Uh, it was, it was on Hollywood Boulevard across from the Chinese theater. My signature night in the phone survey business was April 29th, 1992. It was the night that the LA riots erupted at the corner of Florence and Normandy. Me, locked in a windowless boiler room, had no idea that the world had changed. Around 7 o'clock that night, our boss was pacing around the room, yelling at us to pick up the slack and get those demographically desirable surveys going. Come on, you people, work those phones. What's going on here? Where are all my black people in Los Angeles? <laughs> that, that happened. That happened. <laughs> As my career continued to go nowhere, I had no prospects that I, as either a writer through my high-powered agent kept promising me he'd get me a meeting with one of his high-powered clients who were showrunners. Those failed to materialize. I concentrated on writing my spec material and waiting by the phone. As my overnight dash to stardom became a slog to stay alive, I realized that I had to give up the pipe dream of instant TV stardom for a much more realistic plan, winning a fortune on Jeopardy. <laughs> As I said earlier, I was book smart. I thought it perfectly reasonable that I would not only win on Jeopardy, but become at least a five-time champion, making upwards of $100,000. That didn't happen. Uh, I did okay. I did okay, but okay just gets you a parting gift of a cello kitchen sponges. As regulation time ticked down that day, I had one more shot at cash money victory. I landed the final daily double. The category was science. Taking a Hail Mary pass, I bet 90% of all my money on that one question. And I still to this day remember seeing my future come across that blue TV screen. His famous law of chemistry states that the absolute pressure and volume of a given mass of confined gas are inversely proportional. Humming, humming, humming like my comedy idol Jackie Gleason on The Honeymooners, I gasped, who is Sir Isaac Newton? No, as Alex Trebek said it, I was transported back in space and time to my high school chemistry class <laughs> as I goofed off and made fun of Mr. Morgan droning on about, you guessed it, Boyle's Law. <laughs> I'll take shitty jobs for 25, Alex. <laughs> as my first year in LA neared an end, there I was, barely scraping by from awful job to worse job. Christmas was coming and I had zero money. Well, not quite zero. I did just make $50 by being a haircut final exam subject for some guy trying to get his barber's license. So to quote every lame sitcom character from the 90s, so I had that going for me. I had been in LA for an entire year and had nothing to show for it but a Jeopardy home game and an assortment of Acelo kitchen sponges. But I wouldn't give up. I also knew I couldn't go on like this much longer. Then I saw an ad in The Recycler. The Recycler was like Craigslist, except you could rip it off and put it in your pocket. Uh, the ad said, taxi drivers wanted, no experience necessary. The role I was born to play. <laughs> it was for a new company called Community Taxi of West Hollywood. Okay, it, it wasn't Hollywood, but it was close. 
I went down and I applied to the community taxi office, which was on the corner of Pico and La Brea. As far as I could tell, the company was owned by several Russian guys, all named Boris. <laughs> but it was run day to day by a non-Russian guy named Bert. Bert had to be the most confident and charismatic guy I ever met who had three missing front teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Bert explained the way things would work to me and my fellow applicants. Our cab drivers were only allowed to license to pick up rides in the city of West Hollywood. There were two shifts, the day shift and the night shift. The night shift was where the money was, the day shift was where the living like a regular human being was. I went for the money. My day would start at 5 p.m. and end at 5 a.m. We would be required to pay $55 up front to Boris, any Boris would do. <laughs> which would cover the cab rental and the insurance. We would pay for any and all gas for the night, which in those days was about $1.20 a gallon. So a full night of driving, Bert would said, would cost us about $25. Everything over that was ours to keep. So all I had to do was make more than $80 in fares and tips, and the rest was mine to keep. I had a job in almost Hollywood. My first night as a taxi driver was New Year's Eve, 1992 to 1993. Now, you remember the original Superman movie with Christopher Reeve? There's a great sequence that covers Superman's first night, really being Superman. He gets a cat out of a tree, he foils a robbery, he flies with a pre-crazy Margot Kidder in his arms <laughs> as she think, talk, sings, can you read my mind? My first night as a cab driver was nothing like that. I headed out of the garage on Pico and La Brea at 5 o'clock on the dot with the $80 countdown clock running in my head. I took La Brea to Santa Monica Boulevard and turned left, crossing into West Hollywood. Within 40 seconds, I was flagged down by a guy who wanted, to take, wanted me to take him to the Silver Spoon restaurant on the corner of Santa Monica and Havenhurst. I did so. The meter read $4.25. He gave me a five. $75 to go. <laughs> I'll never forget that first ride I gave that night. I barely remember the rest of the night because from that point on, it was a non-stop blur. I was never not driving. I do remember one ride in particular from that night, one other ride, a ride that would provide a glimpse into what my life as a West Hollywood taxi driver would be like. Besides the rock clubs on Sunset Boulevard, our big clients were all the gay bars along Santa Monica Boulevard. Rage, Trunks, the Motherlode, the Gold Coast. Today those names still sing to me in the voice of our dispatcher, a 50-something British expat named Richard, <laughs> who would call out the names of the bars and the customers almost lyrically. The Rage, picking up Kevin. <laughs> the Gold Coast for Don. That night I picked up a guy coming out of Trunks. He piled in my cab and said to me the following phrase, take me to the probe. <laughs> I said, uh, can you tell me where that is? He said, honey, you're going to drive a cab in West Hollywood and you don't know where the probe is? <laughs> he sighed and he told me. It was and maybe it still is on Highland Avenue, just south of Melrose Boulevard. I took him to the probe and I moved on. By the end of the night, I had cleared a little over $400. Of course, not every night was as good as that, but within a few weeks, I was clearing close to $2,000 a month. A month. But more importantly, I felt alive. I learned the system, and with the system came not just more money, but also the biggest gamble of my day. Though a lot of our work came from folks hailing us on the street, the bread and butter jobs came from phoned in orders. In order to get first crack at one of those from Richard, you had to be sitting first up at the taxi stand for the particular zone of town. The most lucrative zone was zone three, which covered both Santa Monica and Sunset from La Cienega to San Vicente. And the most lucrative time to be first up at zone three was precisely at 5.20 in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. That's when a guy named Greg, who lived around the corner on North Palm Drive, called for a cab to take him to his bartending job on Abbott Kinney in Venice. If you got that call, then your day started with a $40 trip, including tip, that would have you halfway to the nut by six o'clock. By, but there was a downside to being first up zone three at exactly 520, Monday through Friday, and that downside had a name, Shotzi. <laughs> I'm not even sure if his name was Shotzi. He was a very frail man in his mid to late 50s who made the mother load at the corner of Santa Monica and Robertson his office every day from roughly nine to five. At exactly 520 every day, he would call a community taxi and request a ride home, which was a trip of about four blocks and 40 minutes due to Shotzi's extreme state of inebriation and his frail body, which required his driver not only to help him into the cab, but then out of the cab and up the steps to his apartment, at which time the driver would be paid $2 in community taxi coupons. So <laughs> I'd have the luck 
when I had the luck to get first up on Zone 3 at exactly 5.20 on Monday through Friday, and the radio would crack with Richard Stentorian, first up Zone 3, I'd call on my cab number, 44, and either hear back 920 North Palm for Greg, or the dreaded mother love for Shotzi. <laughs> By the time I'd been driving for almost a year, my score was awesomely lucrative trips to Venice, 62, Shotzi, 38. So I was in the lead, but still. <laughs> Shotzi could ruin your whole night. But like a Vegas gambler who should walk away from the blackjack tables, I just love the action too much. I grew not just to appreciate this job, but to love it. I loved every second of it, Shotzi and all. I saw the entirety of the human experience. Bobby Brown's tour manager taught me the best place to buy crack. It was... <laughs> it was... Maybe still it? No, it couldn't be anywhere. It's not there anywhere. It was behind the Burger King on the corner of Highland and Yucca. <laughs> You know where all those luxury condos are now. Uh, I had massive stars, the spin doctors, in my cab. <laughs> I once had the pleasure of spending the better part of an hour driving around in circles while my cab's back seat was occupied by a hustler whose nom de pimp was International Touch. <laughs> As he conducted business with a rival pimp whose name escapes me now. Uh, maybe Domestic Touch. Uh, <laughs> The two pimps chatted convivially about the business and came to some agreement about which girl belonged to whom, and then I dropped them off at the 7-Eleven on Sunset and Garner, went on my way. A few minutes later, I picked up uh, either Millie or Vanilli. I don't remember. <laughs> I was finally starting to lose heart, though, because I had no prospects in show business, and I wasn't getting any younger, and my self-imposed deadline to either make it or give up by the end of my second year was two months away. And what's worse, I would soon travel back to New Jersey to my baby brother Bill's wedding. Now, Bill wasn't television eyes. That's my brother Pat, who was the best man. Each of my three brothers was going, doing infinitely better than me in the career department at that time. I vowed I would pay for the plane tickets myself, though. They cost a fortune, but I didn't care. But as the wedding neared, I was desperate to make as much money as I could. I hustled every off-the-books ride I could get. I squeezed every cent I could out of that Ford Crown Victoria. And one night, I almost pushed it too far. It began as all nights did, with the question of the hour, Shotzi or no Shotzi? <laughs> First up, zone three. <laughs> 44. A pause. Oh, pricey. <laughs> Mother load for Shotzi. <laughs> 40 minutes and two dollars in coupons later, I was back on the road. I drove like a maniac. I scanned the road for every flagger. I hustled to be first at every zone I could. I prowled the nightclubs. I took risks and picked up folks in off-limits Beverly Hills. Here's what I encountered that night. A seemingly normalish 50-something guy who, once I got him in my car, started on an incoherent rant about Bill Clinton and then slipped on his ass in a liquor store parking lot while getting in a fist fight with a transvestite hooker. <laughs> I had to help him back into the car, him ranting at me all over again so I could get him to his house and get paid. I had two separate trips from LAX to LAX from the Roxbury Club. Another star sighting, the Smothers Brothers. <laughs> a non-star sighting. There was a guy named Dennis Woodruff who drove around a Cadillac plastered with headshots of himself in the sign, actor Dennis Woodruff, hire me. <laughs> That's a real guy. Uh, this night, my passenger was a legitimate Hollywood talent manager who I took home from Dan Tana's restaurant in San Santa Monica and Doheny. As it happened, Dennis Woodruff was driving his headshot plastered Cadillac in front of us. This woman had never seen his car before and she was intrigued. She asked me to flag him down. She wanted to talk to Dennis Woodruff about maybe helping him with his career. So I flagged him down, got out of my cab, walked up to his window and told him just that. A real Hollywood manager was interested in helping his career. This is what he said to me. Oh, come on, man, I'm tired. <laughs> I was tired too, but I had to make that money. Finally, the long night was just about over. It was 4.45 a.m. I had made some money, but not enough. I headed my cab back towards the main office. A block from the garage, I spotted two kids, about 13 and 11, standing on a corner trying to hitchhike. I felt bad for them, and I felt like I could make a few more bucks. They hopped in the car and told me their mom would be able to pay me the seven bucks or so it cost to take them to their home in South Central. I took them. They seemed nice enough. I pulled up to a modest home on the street full of modest homes where several kids were standing in front of the driveway. It was a warm night, so my driver's window was rolled down. As I stopped in front of the house, one of the kids, who couldn't have been any older than nine, 
greeted me in my cab by raising a 9mm Glock out of the pockets of his hoodie and pointing it directly at my face. I almost crapped my pants, <laughs> but the girl in the back just chuckled and said to the boy, very matter of fact, Oh, come on, Wayne, put down that 9. <laughs> he did. I uncrapped my pants. <laughs> The girl and her brother got out of the cab, and she told me she'd go get the money from her mom. I said, that's okay, and I drove away, very happy to be unshot. I went home, I slept for an hour and a half, and got one of my fellow taxi drivers to take me to the airport for my brother's wedding. As I watched my brother and his new bride dance, and as I ate more food than I ever had in some time, I thought about it, about it about giving up and staying in Jersey. Living back home for a bit with my parents till I got some kind of job, maybe my older brother helping me get some kind of job in New Jersey. Then hanging out at the bar at the reception, I saw that the TV was showing a rerun of The Golden Girls. God damn it, somebody was being paid to write that shit. <laughs> I knew that I could not give up. I had to go back and honor my pledge to stick with it, at least until the year was out, and maybe another. The day after my brother's wedding, I boarded a plane back to L.A., and I can't say I knew my break would come. I only hoped. I got back to L.A. on Monday and drove my cab that night. On Tuesday, I got a call from my high-powered agent. He had a meeting for me. It was for a pilot of a low-budget sketch comedy show called The News with a Z. Ending words with a Z was once considered very cool. <laughs> the meeting was the next morning at 11 a.m., and my agent told me to come ready to pitch some sketch ideas. Luckily, I had a lot. Still, I didn't sleep at all that whole rest of the day, and I spent the entire time driving that night, going over my pitches in my head and coming up with several more. At 11 the next morning, I walked sleep-deprived into a tiny office in a small bungalow building in Studio City. Well, as it turned out, the producer of the show, a funny and cocksure guy named Michael Wilson, didn't want to hear my pitches. <laughs> Score another one for my high-powered agent. Michael chatted for a bit about the show, then he held up my packet of sketch material and said, I read your stuff, it's funny, it's two weeks at $1,000 a week and we start on Monday. I walked out of that office floating on air. I had my first paying job as a writer in Hollywood. Well, Studio City. <laughs> as it turned out, that two-week job became a four-week job, and when the pile was picked up a few months later, it became my first steady job in TV, and would lead either directly or indirectly to every other job I've had in this business, and put me in the same room at a party thrown by one of my new co-workers with the amazing, beautiful, talented woman who would become my wife. Of course, I didn't know all that then. All I knew as I walked out of the bungalow office on Radford Avenue that day was I'd done what I set out to do when I moved to Hollywood, and soon, I no longer have to spend my time with whores and thieves and drug addicts. <laughs> I was going to work in show business. to call your attention to something that Barnes & Noble is doing. It's part of their outreach. Um, it's called the <coughs> Barnes & Noble Book Fair. So anybody's like teaching, um, writing outside the school situation or young kids, grade school age. It's not really for university, but it is for uh, younger people. And they can do a book fair um, with Barnes & Noble's help and they get to pick their books. They can come in, they can use the space, uh, they'll be online, and Barnes & Noble will support them all the way. So it's just some, some reading, writing, outreach that Barnes & Noble is doing, and we appreciate them having us here. So uh, there's some more of these flyers over there, too, if anybody's interested, especially if you're working with like a community um, writing group or something like that. It's something that they might be interested in. All right, so that concludes our evening. Uh, thank you to Michael. Thank Absolutely. you to our faculty for showing up, everybody for coming. Um, our next event will be uh, November 30th at the Last Bookstore downtown. Um, our faculty reader will be Amy Gersler, and the theme is A Blank in Time. For Madeline Langles, A Wrinkle in Time. So, yeah, happy Halloween. Thank you. Woo.